I'm not scared to have a fight if you cross a line. You know, you'd beat the crap out of somebody. Cricket bats, yes. Hockey sticks, yes. But not knives. Sadiq Khan, welcome to Unfiltered. A word about your parents then, because seven boys and a sister. I mean, you're a parent yourself, obviously. They must have had a real job on their hands. Look, I'm in awe of, of my parents. My, my father passed away in 2003, September the 4th, 2003. Uh, uh, my mum's still going strong at age one, age two. She's, she's, the, do, she's, the, the, she's the Don Corleone of the, the Khan family, the, the matriarch. She's, a, a, a she's, gangster. She's, she's the boss. <laughs> yeah, she, she's the G. Uh, but, but here's the thing about, let me tell you about my, so, so my grandparents, so my family's originally from India, what is now India. And in 1947, uh, when the British Empire decided to leave India, they very, very speedily partitioned India into India in the middle, West Pakistan on one side, East Pakistan on the other side. And the short version of the long story is if you're of Muslim faith, you basically left India to go to either West Pakistan or East Pakistan. If you were a Hindu or Sikh in what is now West, what was then West Pakistan, East Pakistan, you went to India. And so my family, both my maternal family and paternal family, had to rapidly leave India. Uh, and my dad's side was quite wealthy, and go to, they both ended up in Karachi, which was then the capital of uh, Pakistan. So my grandparents had the trauma of being migrants from India to uh, Pakistan. Um, my my parents wanted a better life for their kids, um, and so were migrants to this country. And so I'm the first in three generations of Khans who has no intention of being a migrant. But also they made huge sacrifice. I'll tell you, I'll tell you an amazing fact about, about me, which is I was born in St. George's Hospital in Tootin, uh, raised in a council estate up the road in Ellsfield, uh, ended up buying a property, uh, a stone's throw from St. George's, and I live a longer stone's throw from St. George's. I've moved in a radius of about three miles in my entire life, right? My parents moved you know, three, four, five thousand miles, so learned a new language, learned a new culture, raised all these kids. And my dad and mum still sent money back to Pakistan on a regular basis to support their family. And my mum still does support her family, send remittances back. And so I'm in awe of them because, you know, it's hard enough raising the two kids that I've got. And, you know, we're middle class now, right? But they've them raising eight kids really well. I just, I'm in awe of them in relation to the sacrifices they've made. I, I recognise the challenges uh, they had. I mentioned, you know, earlier on that, the, you know, National Front, the racism and stuff. So you're going to a new country, you've been invited, by the way. There were adverts in newspapers in Pakistan invited them here. You know, my dad, who's an educated man, I'm not saying this in a pejorative way at all, you know, could earn more money as, as a bus driver, and he loved being a bus driver, and we're very proud of him, than he could do in other jobs, because those are the jobs that people like him were expected to do, right, uh, for more than 25 years. And so, you know, raised a family, notwithstanding the racism and so forth, and I, I'm in awe of them. I'd just like to delve, I don't want to plumb this too deeply, but the racism and how it intersects with the British Pakistani experience. Um, you mentioned earlier that you weren't an amateur boxer, but I've got a quote here that you've given before about that experience growing up. And you said, in our area, on our estate, there were certain things you couldn't say and get away with. Mm. So if somebody called you the P word, that means there's a fight. That's it. We're having a fight. You couldn't allow that to be tolerated. As not an amateur boxer, but a boxer, you must be sort of partially aware of your record in those fights. How did you get on? What was it like? Brutal. Yeah, yeah. listen, uh, about the, what, was, what, was interesting was, what was interesting was the sense of solidarity. And so there are a few, a few things that are unacceptable. The N word, the P word. Uh, we, we, there weren't many Jewish people in our estates. The Y word didn't, didn't, didn't come up on the estate. It came later on, on the football terraces and so forth. Yeah. Um, that's a, that sense of solidarity is really empowering. It gives you courage. You, you know, listen, for those that have never seen me, I'm, I'm not the tallest man in the world or the widest man in the world. So, you know, um, but I'm not scared to have a fight if you if you cross a line. Uh, and and, and that, that confidence comes from feeling empowered by your mates. Um, and so there's, a, there's a, a, you know, so, so uh, you know, unless you're at, at number 20 to 1 by the NF, you, in which case the advice is run, um, you have that fight. Because if you tolerated those sorts of words, you could spread. But also there's the issue of respect. If you allow people to disrespect you, that's a problem. Uh, what's interesting, and I, I, I reflect on this a lot, both as a parent, as a member of parliament, and now as the mayor, is I can't think of one case, and there are lots of fights in the state where a knife was brought. You know, mm. cricket bats, yes. Hockey sticks, yes. Um, we didn't have baseball bats in those days, um, but not knives. Because um, you'd, you know, you'd beat the crap out of somebody, but there was, again, a line. You know, I can't, I, again, I can't remember growing up anybody 
lost their lives mm. in these fights. And, and and if you went back in the TARDIS now, they, you could call us a gang. We weren't a gang. We didn't you know, have a name and stuff, but we were mates hanging around and stuff. But mm. it was really important, that issue of, you know, I don't mind you, you, you having a go at me, but not because of my color of my skin. That mm. is unacceptable and mm. stuff. And so it could be different schools. That's fine. I don't, it's not fine, but you know what I mean? That, that's understandable. I know. But not race. Race, you've crossed the line. Uh, you know, and um, yeah, you know, you know I, I, I say this with with trepidation. I can't think of a fight I lost, but let me put it that way. Oi, oi, here we go. Um, <laughs> let's, uh, that's really interesting, what you just said there about serious youth violence and knives. I mean, I want to, if we have time, we'll talk about that issue in a bit more detail later on. But just quickly, what do you think's changed? What's different? I mean, how has London changed? How has the culture of the estate and the, youth, the young people in this city What's different about it? A lot of things. So, so firstly, I, I just think about the number of activities we could do growing up. Right. After school. You know, there was Cricket schools clubs. There were, exactly. There were schools. Spot. <laughs> there were school clubs. There were youth clubs. The boxing club. Cricket. Football. After school. Weekends. Summer holidays. The latchkey club. Summer schemes. Keeping young people busy was really important. The other thing is this. Listen, I'm not, I'm not you know, I'm somebody who loves America, loves American culture. But we also have very little access to culture in relation to what's going on in America. Baseball bats, knives, gangs, turfs and so forth. We had, we literally had growing up three channels, BBC One, BBC Two and ITV. Later on Channel Four came in H two. There was no satellite TV. You know, radio was the, the issue was music, the American culture of, of music. And so some of that is, you know, we've become Americanized in relation to, you know, gangs and so forth, so forth. But actually you gotta give young people you you gotta keep young people busy. Mm. You gotta give them good things, constructive things to do. You wanna think about my mentors, not just my big brothers and my dad, but you know, the boxing coach, the cricket coach, my teachers, you know, and when you speak to young people now and you say, Who's your mentor? and there's silence. You know, who'd you look up to? Who's your role model? Who'd you aspire to be like? And there's silence. But, you know, that being said, until I was an until I was Later on in secondary school, and the head, t a new head teacher joined our secondary school, an Asian man called Mr. Bakari. And as Bakari, he was the first Asian man I met who wore a suit to go to work. Because my dad wore a uniform. Uh, you know, many of my black mates, their dads wore a uniform. It could be going to the FX factory next door or to go into the railways or whatever. I, you know, I, I'd seen white people on buses wearing a suit or on the tube. I'd never seen an Asian man wearing a suit to go to work because. That's not the sort of work we did, right? And so Mr. Bakari, who was the head teacher of, of Ernest Bevin School, who became a mentor to me, he was the first person who looked like my dad, who was who was in a top position, head teacher of, of, of a school. So you mentioned what's had changed now is is also that sense of, you know, having a role model you can look up to and copy and stuff. So I'm not sure now young people have somebody they know, and Mr. Bakari was somebody who became a friend as well as a mentor who you can look up to and be like, do you see what I mean? Mm. And I, I'm, I'm a firm believer in, believer in you can't be if you can't see it. But if you can see bad stuff, so if you, if you on your estate, there's somebody who's got, you know, nice watch, nice bling, nice trainers, and he's a member of a gang, you can see it and you want to be it and stuff, mm -hmm. right? When I was growing up, it was very different. <clears throat> I mean, that must have just been a transformative experience, meeting Mr. Bakari, right? It must oh, listen, I've got it too. You know, firstly, it gave you a sense of, wow. I mean, it really did, wow. Uh, you know, the, the, the head teacher, that former head of Mr. Potter, you know, quintessential white head teacher. I say this not in a, you know, you know, posh head teacher, right? We mm -hmm. love, we respected him, mm -hmm. a bit scary and so forth. And this guy comes in and he's got a name called Bakari, which is very similar to, you know, we've got, that's a, I recognize that sort of name. He's a Muslim. Mm. Um, he's the head teacher. He's got this, you know, power and, and aura around him. Um, and it, it was, you know, it was, it was that when you think, yeah. And there was another, there's another example where I remember when I was about 16 or 17, I remember the year, it's 1987. And I saw on TV, cause my dad was assiduous. The, the, the only time you could watch the news was nine o'clock or 10 o'clock. The BBC news was at nine o'clock. ITV news at 10 o'clock. There weren't all these other news channels and so forth, but watching the news, I can't remember which night it was. It must've been a few days after the election and seeing these four people, um, Bernie Grant, uh, Paul Bartang, um, Diane Abbott and Keith Vaz elected to parliament as MPs. And it's just like, it's like what? They're, so, you know, the, the MP in Tooting, a guy called Tom Cox, you know, we never at that stage met him. I later on became friends with him. But, you know, we never see, we never seen people in parliament, you know, when, when we think of parliament as the mother of all parliaments, and they look like that. Mm. It's like, you know, and, you know, Bernie Ball, you know, Diane and uh, Keith Vaz. And obviously for us, 
all four was an impact because we had mates who looked at all four, obviously Keith Vaz because he's Asian, but all four of them. And so these things when you're growing up where you think, and then, you know, and so, and, and I don't think people realize now how much we've progressed. So I'm somebody who can say, Ollie, and I say this genuinely, I think it's consistent to say on the one hand, there's been massive, 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 positive, transformative progress in this city, in this country, which makes me immensely proud. There's no other city in the world I'd raise my kids. But on the other hand, we've still got big problems. We can't pretend it's mission accomplished because of the fantastic progress we've made. Mm -hmm. A few years later than what we were just talking about, and about nine years ago now, you were diagnosed with asthma. I imagine that was fairly surprising as a, well, yeah, a boxer, a man who's fit. Can you tell me a little bit more about that diagnosis? I imagine it surprised you, right? Well, there's a couple of things about that, which the first thing is this. I, you know, I, I, I've got to be honest and have the humility to recognise. I'm the guy that when I became a partner, in 1997, when I was only 26, but what I negotiated was a car park space on Museum Street for my Saab convertible. I had this gorgeous black Saab convertible with leather interior. Um, that's the reason I'm telling you the story is not to boast about my Saab, but to, give you, <laughs> to, to explain to explain my journey. Do you know yeah, what yeah, I mean? Yeah. No, go ahead. Uh, and then when I become an equity partner, uh, and, and Anise is born by then my oldest, uh, and having a two seat is not good for your back when you put in a car seat in the back and so forth. Um, I, you know, I, I swapped my Saab convertible for a Land Rover Discovery, a seven-seater, right? I, I kid you not, I left London probably twice when I mm. the Land Rover Discovery. When I'm an MP, uh, I'm a minister, uh, as part of the collective responsibility, you got you, you tow the party line once it's been agreed in cabinet. I voted for a third runway in Heathrow. And that's just, that backstory is important, Ollie, because I want to be honest with, with your listeners, but also explain my journey. In addition, I'm quite, I am quite fit, you know, I, I take pride in, I enjoy football. I still play football when I can, I still play tennis when I can and so forth. And I'm reasonably well read. I'd like to think, you know, an ex-cabinet minister, ex-shadow cabinet, parliamentarian, but I'm so ignorant. What do I mean by still being ignorant? So, so I, 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 in a gratuitous effort to suck up to the standard to get their endorsement to run for mayor, but also to raise money for charity. Uh, agreed to run the London Marathon in 2014 and, you know, have a fourth medical before I run it, which is important to the story. Passed with flying colours in relation to the medical. All the tests are done. I train for the marathon. I only have eight weeks to train, ten weeks to train. I run along the streets of London while I'm training to get to get an idea of, because it gives you, gets you an idea of what the marathon would be like. So rather than running in a park, you run along streets to keep, keep you in the field of stuff. Mm -hmm. I run the marathon, raise lots of money for charity, um, then a few months later, I noticed problems in relation to my, you know, when I'm running, when I'm sprinting for a ball playing football, I, I'm out of breath quicker. You know, at night time, I'm coughing a lot. Uh, you know, I'm clearing my throat a lot. So if you and I were talking in 2014, I'd be clearing my throat three, four, five times during the course of the interview. And, you know, you're so busy doing stuff, you don't think about getting it checked out and stuff. And then it got to a stage where my wife, you know, said, listen, so, so, you know, you, so you've, got, you've got to go and get this checked out. You, you know, you know, and it was, and you say, you th okay, let's go. And so she even went with me because she didn't trust that I'd go to the GP and get it checked out. I was dumbstruck when the doctor did the test and she said, you've got asthma. Because, you know, when I was at school, there were probably two people in the entire year that had asthma. They had the blue pumps, they didn't play sports, they didn't run around the playground. And that's my view of asthma. Um, but also, I didn't understand because I'd, I'd never had asthma or bronchitis or breathing issues. And there's a thing called adult onset asthma. And then you start speaking to experts, you can do further tests, you start doing research, and you discover that actually there's these things in the air we can't see called particulate matter, nitrogen oxide, nitrogen dioxide, and it's an indivisible killer, leading to children having stunted lungs, adults with a whole host of health issues from asthma to cancer, dementia to heart disease. And I was blown away. And also the causes of air pollution are the same as the causes of climate change. And so even somebody who's quite well informed thinks I'm a progressive. Well, I hoped, hopefully, I'm a progressive. I assumed climate change was something that happens to them, global south, other parts of the country, but also happens 20, 30 years down the road. In fact, what I since discovered, uh, you know, is climate change is happening to us, happening now, but also linked with that is air pollution. You know, each year in our city in London around 4,000 premature deaths linked with air pollution across the country, between nine and 10,000. Across the globe, 9 million deaths a year linked to air pollution. How, you mentioned your eldest there, and we'll come into the policy in a second, but I just, quick question about 
how she informs your environment, how both of your daughters inform your environmentalism? Because obviously it's a bit of a hot button issue for the younger generation. Was it something they put on your radar? How have they changed how you thought about it? So, so firstly, uh, listen, I'm not going to fall down the cliche line about, you know, in relation to, you know, I only work up because of my kids. I work up because of self-interest. Let me be frank. Had I not got asthma, I'm not sure if I'd been on this journey, right? Well, okay. And so, you know, I've got to be honest, the self-interest being diagnosed has made me do the research. And then I met this wonderful woman called Rosamond. Uh, whose daughter, age nine, had passed away from air pollution, as, uh, asthma caused by air pollution. But my daughters, um, you know, and their generation, um, you know, are amazing and immense. You know, my daughters, you know, you know, are ahead of me in relation to what they know about it, what they knew about it. And so when I told them about this, it was like, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like they, they knew about it and stuff, right? What are you talking, you know? So it's like you can't, this sort of stuff, I'm not teaching my kids, they're teaching me all the time in relation to air pollution. Where you, you know, they, There's a phrase my daughter used years ago, uh, which I still tease her about, saying she's going to buy some pre-loved clothes. I said, what, what are pre-loved clothes, right? It's, you know, pre-loved clothes. And mm. so, it's, uh, you know, because, because, you know, because why go and buy sort of disposable cheap stuff from the shops when you can buy vintage? Stuff? The other thing is vintage, right? You see, I'm learning the jar jar jargon as well, pre-loved vintage and stuff. Um, way ahead of the game. And it's, it's all linked, by the way, in relation to how you make clothes, how you use clothes, how you reduce use um, from, you know, m both my kids, you know, assiduous walkers and, and you know, they use public transport, um, you know, be because it's, it's different generationally and culturally. When I, be when I became 17, the, the number one thing I wanted to do was to get driving lessons, pass my driving test and get a car. That was a right of passive in your age, 16, 17, 18, living in South London, particularly if you're from working class family. So also a sense of prestige. Mm -hmm. It's so, you know, I've passed my driving test. I've now got a car. My first car, Mini Clubman, I got when I was 17, 18, right? It was a hand-me-down from a brother, but, I, you know, but that's very different now. My kids have very, very different relation to, they, they, they use public transport everywhere. Um, you know, a lot of their mates haven't learned to drive. Um, you know, I, I, for, I had to force my kids to learn how to drive because why don't, because I, I think I, my point is it's an important skill to have. You know, mm -hmm. it looks great in the CV. It's a life skill when you go on holiday, you may need to hire a car, whatever. For them, it's like, why? We've got great public transport. We don't need to drive and stuff. And so it's fascinating how that generation and, and you know, this Gen Z generation are mocked relentlessly by my generation, right? Yep. We can learn a thing or two or three from that generation. Those lessons then, how have they informed in your role as London Mayor? And the policy around this issue, what are you doing? What can we do to a greater extent to improve the quality of the air that we all have to breathe? Well, firstly, this book isn't a political memoir. It's really important to, to, to explain that. What this book is, is a handbook, if you like, of what I've learned. But also there's the seven big obstacles I, you know, I, I've sort of categorized that, that you face dealing with this issue from, you know, um, um, fatalism, there's nothing we can do about it, to apathy, it doesn't affect me, to cynicism, you're all the same, uh, to hostility. And we're, we're going through that now in relation to the ultra low uh, emission zone. So, and but it's also a book of hope because when I when I first became mayor, I was told um, by experts at King's College it would take 193 years, 193 years, to bring the air quality in London within lawful limits. 193 years. We're going to do it by 2025, right? In two years, uh, with the ultra low emission zone in central London, in two years we managed to reduce the toxicity in our air by almost 50 percent in two years. We've managed to increase cycling lanes fivefold in London uh, from what it was when I first became mayor, 50 kilometres to more than 300 kilometres. And I could go on in relation to stats and achievements mm. and so forth. The point being is you can't do something about it. And so I'm not saying I'm the most radical green activist in the world. I'm not. I still fly. I, you know, I still sometimes eat meat, you know, um, and so forth. My point being is that there, there's something we can do to affect change in our city, in our country. And let me tell you why it's important. Last year, you would have experienced, as I did, temperatures in our city north of 41 degrees Celsius. The year before, you would have witnessed, as I did, a flash flood in our cities leading to stations being flooded, people's flats and businesses uh, being uh, flooded. This is a very much a now issue and a us issue. And like I said, air pollution and uh, climate change are linked. I had a conversation this week with Lord Deben. Lord Deben used to be called John Gummer, and he's the chair of the Climate Change Committee. And he's a uh, this is important to the story, so he'll forgive me for saying this. He's a Tory, right? He's a Tory serving Thatcher's government. Government. Yeah. He will he will say to you if you ask him how important fighting air pollution is to tackling climate change and how it's a cross party issue, and all of us, all of us have a skin in the game. So I mentioned before my selfishness in relation to my journey, but actually all of us uh, have have skin in the game. Oh,